the, today we're talking a lot about um, treaties or this this word treaty um, has now come back into focus and, and everybody sort of running around now like jackrabbits you know very enthused about um, being involved in negotiating a treaty um, now I wrote an article um, before January 26th, pointing out the need to be very careful about what it is that you do when you're talking about treaty. I had four and a half years as the director of research for the NAC, the National Aboriginal Conference on Treaty, when Malcolm Fraser and his government, which at the time the treasurer was John Howard, when they agreed that they would negotiate a treaty with Aboriginal people. Now, at that time, I was in the public public prosecution's office in Sydney, uh, in the district court in criminal law, and that's where I was working. I was um, as a public prosecutor, but part of my issue was always that you know um, uh, there was this announcement came up that the government wanted to negotiate a treaty, and I sort of thought, oh, yeah. Okay, I hope they know what they're doing. That's all that came into my head. And then all of a sudden, <coughs> Bill Bird, who was the then chairman of the NAC, Pastor Bill Bird, he called me up and had a lunch with me in Sydney and said, Michael, we would like you to come down to Canberra and work with us. But at that time, it was about the World Council of Indigenous People because they were about, they had been nominated um, in, I think it was Nicaragua or somewhere, where the, uh, uh, Honduras somewhere, where the, that last World Council of Indigenous Peoples conference took place. And people like, sorry, Lyle Munro Sr. and um, led a delegation to that conference, um, in the, to that conference. And of course, Australia was selected to host that in 1981. <coughs> so Bill Bird said, well, we need someone to um, help us um, write all the papers, do all the research. We need to put a good submissions to this World Conference um, on all the things that have gone wrong in this country. And so um, I went to... Um, Frank Walker, the then New South Wales Attorney General, who was my boss, and um, and I asked them, could I take leave um, for, I think it was three months, uh, to come up to that uh, February, I think it was, um, conference for the World Council of Indigenous People. And so I, I came to that conference, and uh, I they released me uh, for three months initially, and um, I then had to go back. And so I came to Canberra and I, I worked on that conference. And uh, then at the end of that time, it, it was very, it was for me and for a lot of other Aboriginal people, including a lot of um, white people, such as the late Nugget Coombs, um, who I heard say at a legal conference, international law conference there, that they that he organised and hosted at the ANU at the time that coincided with the with the tree, with that um, World Council World Conference. He said to them there that um, I've listened to the papers and the submissions that were made by the National Aboriginal Conference, and Aboriginal people have now come to a stage where they have the ability to control all their own affairs because of the papers that they presented, which were very professional. Yeah. And the profession, professional aspect of it was simply because we were not being emotive, we were not appealing to the sympathies and expectations of the public and sort of running, crying foul and being a, being a victim. We did not do that. We were very. Pro the NAC was very professional in presenting the issues, hardcore issues, as they were, and explained in detail the damage done to our people. And so, at the end of that, the NAC then said to me, the leadership of the NAC thanked me, 
<coughs> and um, I must admit that at that time, um, one of my co-workers who I engaged to, to assist me in doing that was Marcia Langton and, um, and, and a bloke by the name of um, um, Eric Wilmont. And uh, Eric left before, he, before that conference came about because Eric um, got his job with um, the head of the Institute of Aboriginal Islander Studies. So he felt that, you know, he would be compromising his position if he were to um, stay with that little uh, three-man team that I'd put around me. Um, Marcia stayed and, um, and between us, we, uh, with the assistance of what Eric had already done, we put together a fantastic overview of an insight into Aboriginal affairs and the wrongdoings of what was happening, both legal, socially, economically, and culturally, the damage that was being done to our people. And so, uh, quite frankly, the NAC papers were, were very good because they ended up becoming foundational documents um, that could launch the other arguments from different parts of the world because it, we took away that that motive aspect of of our arguments and so um, and we didn't speak as victims we were speaking as people who survived a, a horrible colonial history and um, yeah and, and and so between myself uh, between Eric Marcia and myself um, the NAC had a brilliant submissions, set of submissions. Um, not everybody, every Aboriginal person got to see that because we had the opposition. We had the people who were saying, oh, we're not involved and we should be, there should be independent status and all that stuff. Yes, of course, you know, but we also have to take into account that there's 400, over, you know, 600, 500 nations before the Whitefellas came here and there's about 300 still surviving, so, in their own right. And, um, not everybody thinks the same, so of course they all have their own priorities. And yes, of course, they all have the need to be represented by their own voice. Um, and um, at that time, the NAC were represented 49 regions, yeah, um, which was whittled down to 36, but nonetheless, the people who were elected were elected on the basis of a regional association culturally. Um, but anyway, we, we felt that um, the papers covered the key aspects of, of um, what was happening in Australia at the time. And of course, that then flowed on to um, becoming foundational information and data that helped us launch towards a treaty because it, it showed what had to be done to fix it up. And so we thought, well, okay, if we're going to address these issues that we, we complained about and that we talked about in the, in the World Council Conference on Indigenous People, <laughs> then it, it would, you know, it's just common sense, it, it would follow that <clears throat> we would then use all of those things that we talked about to lead off into a settlement of some kind, yeah? And, um, and of course, um, at this time, a few months earlier, or several months earlier, 1979, um, the government had already agreed that they would negotiate a treaty with, and they made it very clear in writing that they would negotiate it with the elected body at that time, the National Aboriginal Conference. And, um, and of course, so they were two years down the road, um, Lois O'Donoghue and um, Cedric Jacobs from Western Australia um, had carriage of a lot of that earlier material with the NAC. They put out pamphlets and, they, and they'd already commenced um, programs of um, community consultations across Australia. And um, Cedric Jacobs and, and uh, Lois Jo O'Donoghue um, were the ones who were leading that. And they really put together some good information in terms of what the people were saying. And, um, and so by the time I um, was then engaged as a director of that research for the treaty, um, they had already commenced a very good process. So I had, I had a platform from which to work from. And um, so it wasn't as though I was starting um, on a complete new program. Um, and um, 
and their their issues were were very simple in design at the fir in the first instance they were not dealing with this the question of sovereignty at that time they were not dealing with the issue of um, you know all the legal ills of of colonialism um, and what we had to unravel and undo and um, but they were dealing with things like um, the return of um, um, material culture, return of human remains from overseas and domestic um, museums, um, which is now a, a major um, sort of piece of activity going on around the world right now. And, um, and quite frankly, Malcolm Fraser made that possible. You know? And in those, from those early years of that formation or you know, foundational stuff that was done by people like Ma um, Lowager and um, and Cedric Jacobs. <coughs> there were other things that um, at that time as well, and um, you know, the, the the other key aspect of that was um, had a lot to do with home caring our people, looking after the old ones, looking after our people in the communities, and. Um, and, and quite frankly, it, it took a bit, of, a bit of time to develop the home care sort of stuff um, in the States to begin this pro program of home care. But I have documents in my possession where the NAC were very persistent about getting those social um, matters and social needs um, addressed quickly. And of course, that's when we realized in the NAC that, you know, housing... Um, addressing social issues, legal matters, etc. Education. These things can be done now. You didn't need a treaty for that because they were basic fundamental human rights yeah? uh, aspects and, and we were pushing that. So you, you, and as Malcolm Fraser said back then, we don't need a treaty to do that. <laughs> we have a social obligation to do that. And so that's the, so. When we begin to deal with treaty, we're starting to talk about treaty. We really need to understand the key elements of treaty making. Yeah, there are things that they have already in place to deal with some of the issues that our people are are complaining about, and we don't have to go too far into those, like addressing more money for Aboriginal health, more money for Aboriginal legal services, more money for um, addressing um, incarceration rates, um, developing policies and strategies to um, do family planning, family, family um, circles and family support to stop the children from being taken from their families. We need to address the issues of um, alcoholism and drug addiction in our communities. We we really must do that, and of course the you know we do, we don't need a treaty to do that. Yeah, that's that's a social obligation on the part of the state, and um, and while ever the state's ignoring that, we have a problem, and our children will continue to be taken from mothers who are not doing the right thing and. When we look at that, we cannot, in all conscience, blame the mother. We can't. It's absolutely wrong to do that. We have to blame the social ills. And if the government are not going to work with us to address those social ills through their police, working with community, working with the families, working with the people, we have to stop the process of demonization. Yeah, this has got to stop. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, uh, we also have to understand that you know the demonising of Aboriginal people in our communities, you know, is is uh, not necessarily addressing the social ills. Um, let's be honest. You know, let's let's ask the question of why they move people from Wombulgari. We need to do a deep inside investigation into what was that all about. Yeah. When you consider that um, one of the men spent you know, 10 years in jail for something he really did not do. Yeah. 
And the other, however many charges all his brothers got got um, tagged with, the public don't realise that they dropped every one of those charges on all those brothers. Yeah? And so uh, there, there was nothing. But they destroyed that community. The government destroyed that community. The government moved everybody. Yeah? And of course, then we find out, we have to have a look at, well, what's there? That's what we have to ask. What's there then? What are the other, other factors behind that? Yeah? Down the road, you've got the Argyle Diamond Mine. A little bit next, right adjacent to the uh, is the Great Ward River Scheme. Yeah? And then you've got to have a look at, okay, what are they doing at the Ord River Scheme? Oh, we just found that they're, they're planning a big city there at the Ord. Yeah? Blackfellas didn't know that, but that's the long-term planning of these white people. So we have to look at all the hidden factors. We have to look at what's going on, you see. You see, whitefellas, whitefellas plan 10, 20, 50 years ahead. Yeah? Us blackfellas plan for tomorrow, or maybe tonight. Yeah? That's it. Because we know tomorrow going to come anyway. Yeah? So what happens tomorrow? We deal with <laughs> that on the day. But we don't uh, plan to build a city in 50 years' time. Yeah? And we don't work towards achieving that. You know, we don't sit down there and we say, oh, we got all these gold here looking at our little land. We're going to put all you white fellows on top of that and let you farm it until we're ready to come and get it. Yeah? That's what white people do. Government's very clever. So we need to understand the need to, you know, to, to understand the difference when we begin to talk about treaty. We need to know what we're talking about. There are some long-term factors, there are mid-term factors, there are short-term factors, yeah? And we also need to understand what can be addressed now without a treaty and what will we achieve with a treaty. What are we after? And this is something that we desperately need to look at.